please honor the reading of God's word. <laughs> um, because your hearts are fresh. You've been able to receive some new. Like, for instance, we have new coffee in the coffee shop area. If we're done with the cheap stuff, this is really good coffee. <laughs> it's new. It's new. You should, you should check it out. Um, we've got some new things happening, hospitality, just a lot of new things. But watch this. Watch this. Today, we are pleased to introduce to you a brand new church app. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, fake it. I don't care. Um, so some of you are like, I didn't even know we had a church app. That's why I'm taking time now to tell you we have a church app, and we've been operating with an old one that had some limitations, and now it's just crazy how good it is. And the reason I'm telling you this now is because if you download the new church app, every week, my, my, you don't have to download it every week, download it once, every week my sermon notes will be on the church app. So you can follow along, you can take notes on the church app. Not only that, when you lose your bulletin, from now on it's not a problem because everything that you read in your bulletin but forgot is on the new church app, Okay. Every week, there's new information coming on the new church app. And, and uh, not only this, this is one of my favorite. You don't have to be in a Wi-Fi zone to stream the services live. You can actually just use your data to, to stream. So, so please, 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 there's a whole lot of other really good features. Download the new app. If you are an Apple customer, you just go to the App Store, push um, Updates, I was thinking upgrades because I got that. Updates, and it happens automatically. If you're a Google customer, come forward and we will pray for you for your. <laughs> Just kidding. If you're a Google customer, you have, to get you have to get rid of the old app. You have, to, you have to remove the old app and download the new, and, and anyone can download by texting Trinity App, all caps, Trinity App to 77977. Or you can go to your app store. It's there as well. Okay, so, so that's the way. But we really want you to download the app and share it with others because it lets us talk to you all week long. You're like, I don't even want that. Okay, then don't download it. It's not a problem. The new sermon is called Kingdom. Just one word. Kingdom. And would you, as has been our custom all year, declare with enthusiasm our theme verse out of Hebrews chapter 10. Ready, go. So do not, it will be, you need to, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he, I am ready to receive what he has promised. And then out of the gospel of Luke chapter 10, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them two by two ahead of him to the places where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. Go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. You don't need to take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone along the road. When you enter a house... Say this, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will, your peace will rest on them. <laughs> if not, it'll be okay because you'll still keep your peace. It will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick. What? Heal the sick who are there. And tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. When you enter a town and you're not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you, yet be sure of this. Be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. I'm not going to read that because it will leave you depressed. Verse 12 will leave you depressed. I'll just skip over just skip over that. One more verse, Matthew chapter 
4, verse 17. Would you declare it with me? Everyone together, ready, go. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. This, dear friends, is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to begin this new, um, what time is it now? Good. We got, we're good. We're good. Um, I want to begin this new series with, with a sentence that you're going you're gonna to be worried about me, but don't be worried about me. Um, I, I, one of the campus pastors saw the manuscript, and he, he came by the office early this morning. He said, Pastor, sometimes you scare me. I said, sometimes I scare myself, so it's no big deal. But here's the opening sentence to the series. I am so frustrated with Christianity. I mean, I could spend some time talking about priests who molest children or pastors who steal money from the church or members who cheat on spouses or worshipers who are only available to worship when it isn't in conflict with a cowboy schedule. I wasn't going to smile, but I did. I could spend some time talking about hypocrites. I could spend some time talking about Christians who only love people who have the same skin color as themselves. I mean, I could put a pretty long list together if I wanted to, but you probably get the idea from that. I'm really frustrated with Christianity. This past week, I, as I've already mentioned, I was able to preach to the Pentecostal pastors of Russia, their annual conference. And you may remember two years ago, I preached a similar conference, same people, different conference. And, and when I came back, I was so <laughs> enthused by what was happening in Russia because the these pastors had this incredible vision. They were like, we're going to plant 10,000 churches. I think it was in seven years, if I remember correctly. And man, they were planting churches left and right. But you've read in the news that now the Russian government has begun to persecute the church in Russia. And I'll just be honest, it's taken a toll on their hearts. They're, they're a little discouraged. They're a little, a little confused. And, and what I learned this time when I went, instead of paying attention to the news, what I learned is that actually the reason the government is persecuting the Pentecostal church in Russia is because the Russian Orthodox church influenced the government because the Pentecostals were taking all the Orthodox Christians away. But the point, they're still planting churches, but their enthusiasm has diminished. And, and it, was my, it was my privilege to be able to preach to those guys two or three times. And, and you know, I preached what I've been preaching to you about a fresh heart. And, and I reminded them that Jesus said, I will build my church. But he didn't just say it at any old place. He said it in the gates of opposition. He said it at Caesarea Philippi where there was so much resistance and so together, you know, 2,000 pastors, we were just saying it over and over. This is who you are to me now. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the gates of hell will not prevail again. So we just said it over and over. One evening, I did. I prayed for over 1,000 pastors. I got to lay my hands on 1,000 pastors and encourage them. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because it's Christians harassing Christians. And I'm frustrated Christianity. I know from, I, I, read, I read the Bible. I mean, I, I, I know that Jesus wept and Noah got drunk. I, I know that, you know, David lost his temper and Peter betrayed Jesus. I know, I know, I know those stories, but I'm just telling you, I've become so concerned about the current levels of Christianity. And, 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 and it's caused me, not just to, I'm not in a funk here. It's caused me to realize something that I, I had it back here, but it's just coming to the front. Jesus did not come to start a new religion. He came to unveil a kingdom. That's a huge difference. Jesus didn't come to start Christianity. He came to establish heaven's culture in the earth. I mean, it's everywhere. And now that I see it, I'm sorry I haven't seen it earlier, but like Luke, 8, Luke chapter 8, one day, Jesus is preaching to a multitude of people, a very large crowd, and he's teaching them in parables. Now, the word parable is so interesting because it really means <clears throat> hiding the truth. 
It, it means kind of disguising the truth or filtering the truth. And he's teaching them in parables. It happened to be the parable of the farmer and the seeds and, and, and the soil, you know. But afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus what it meant. And Jesus explained to them what it meant. But then Jesus went a step further and he said to these guys, his disciples, he said to them, You guys realize, this is a summary, you guys realize I have to teach the crowds in parables, but you guys. He turned to them, he looked them in the eye, he said, you guys, you have listening hearts. You you gave up the fish, the the fishing boats and the net. You gave it, you gave up, you gave up the accounting practice that was Matthew. You gave up the doctor's practice. That was Luke. You, you, you did what you need to do to get close to me. And he says, to you, I want to give the secrets of the kingdom. The secrets of the kingdom. Are you, that's what got my attention. Come on, church. What if instead of Christianity, we started living in pursuit of the secrets of the kingdom? <laughs> I know what I'm about to say is a little dangerous, and I've prepared to suffer the consequences. I have responsibility to everybody, okay? I love loving all the souls, the ones who are just considering faith for the first time. I love working with the lukewarm sometimes. That's the hardest. But but I love those who are on fire, who have pilgrimaged with Jesus for many, many years. And I'm, I know, I know, I've checked my heart. I'm not in a bad mood, and I don't have much jet lag, a little more second service than the first service. This is not about jet lag, but I am deeply desiring to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. And I've been praying it, and I'm going to keep praying it. Please, Jesus, get us to to the point where you don't have to hold back anything. Because, you see, that's what it was really about. You know, Jesus looks at the multitudes and he says, guys, he says, the reason I, I can't tell them everything that's in my Father's heart, my fa- if I gave them the whole idea that was in my Father's heart, it'd be more harmful to them than it would be good. It's like you don't buy a Honda 650, you know, for a 12-year-old. You don't do that. And Jesus is like, I can't tell them everything that is in my Father's heart. It won't help them, but I'll tell you the secrets. I'll tell you the secrets. Oh, my goodness. What if Jesus told us the secrets of the kingdom? Because I think think he wants to. I'll try to say it another way because obviously you're not connecting yet, but um, something's missing. Something's missing. Maybe it's just in my life. I, I, I'm not going to talk about yours, I'm, but I, I'll just talk about my life. I think something's missing from my life. And I'm more spiritual than all of you put together. I know, I know. <laughs> and yet here I am, ordained with the Assemblies of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, went to youth camp. And, and, and I just don't like Christianity anymore. I don't like the emphases. I don't like the inconsistencies. I mean, Jesus had an eye, his own words, his words. He said, you're going to do greater works than I have done. The whole idea is that we would have this union with Jesus that would bear much fruit that the glory of God would demonstrate and dwell in our relationships and our households. We would go, you know, two by two and we would knock on doors and, and we would say, peace to your household. And not everybody would receive that, but some would receive. The Bible says that we should be able to build houses that will stand regardless of the severity of the storms that come our way, that there's a people who will be kings and priests that will cast out demons and heal the sick and be able to introduce into the culture, you know, hope. The lame would live. I don't know. We talk about these things all the time. We do, we do. And yet divorce is so regular in the church. Cancer is so rampant. Instead of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, it seems like there are church members, mostly in the 9 o'clock service, not so much here, but just... Instead of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, it's like fear, self-pity, and depression in the sports bars, you know? 
and I'm not angry. Do I sound angry? I'm not angry at you. I'm not even angry at me, which is more often than being angry at you. I'm just missing something. And, and when I finally had the courage to say, something's missing, God. The sentence that came to my heart is this. You can't miss something you never had. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And, and, and I thought about, it's impossible for you to miss my Nandy's fried apple pies and seafood gumbo. You can't miss those. I could give you information. I could give you the recipe. I could describe the succulent, wonderful. I could spend a lot of time celebrating Nandy's. But I don't, I miss that because I don't have access to that anymore. And, and, and I wonder why. I mean, I've got a great marriage, but it's better than yours. I've got a great marriage. But why, why do I long for a love that I've not tasted yet? Why do I want to never get old? Some of you are like, too late. <laughs> Why do I imagine soaring through the air like Superman? This was actually last night's dream. Please don't interpret it for me. I, I was just like linked arms with Superman, rescuing damsels in distress all night long. That's why I'm tired this morning. All night long, I, 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 why? Why do I want to beat up the bad guys? Why do I want to be remembered after I die? Why do I want to talk with the animals? And the answer is, I miss that. I, I used to do that. Not, not me personally, but, but that was the original condition of humanity. And the Bible says that the good news is that Jesus came to restore what we lost. When he says, I'm bringing a kingdom and, it, and it's close to you, it's at hand, it's, it's near. He's talking about a life that far exceeds the one in which most of us are currently participating. I'm here to tell you, he has a very high view of what we as human beings could do when we're in union with him, allowing him to restore what's been lost. Again, he, he didn't call himself king of subjects. He called himself king of kings. And, and the Garden of Eden was God's kingdom. It was the place of the dominion of the, of the king. It, it, it was where we lived. At one time, we lived in perfect union with God. We, he gave the jurisdiction of his universes to us. Us and when we made a decision or when we made a decree as humans, oh, there was spiritual force that was released. We were holy. We were we were we, we, we soared. We ruled. We laughed. We loved all in union with with God. But you know the story, right? We lost our place. We thought we were equal to God, and now instead of the pursuit of the secrets of the union in the kingdom, we we're just settling for Christian information, wondering what what's missing. We hope Jesus will take us to heaven where someday we'll finally be happy and finally be, be good. In the meantime, there's somebody here that needs to long with me for the secrets of the kingdom because heaven is not. Heaven's the last thing God wants for you. A little play on words there. He wants, he wants you to have a union that that lives in the life that Jesus died to give us. Some of you remember in Isaiah chapter 9, around Christmas time, we, you'll hear this kind of language. For unto us a child is born, and the government will be upon his, his body. No, no, the shoulders are part of the body. His government will be where? On, in his body. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of Almighty will perform this. Now, 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 if Jesus was that child that Isaiah was talking about, how many of you believe he was? It's not a trick question. One more time. So I'll know you're not asleep. How many of you believe Jesus was that child 
that's much better. I see that hand, I see that hand. Okay, if Jesus was that child, peace is available on the earth. Right, right now, peace is available on, on the earth. And, and, and you see, peace is the culture of heaven. Peace, peace is in heaven, not just the absence of war. Peace means so much more than that. Peace is, peace is satisfaction. Peace is fullness of resource. Peace is the thing my heart longs for. The culture of heaven is peace. I mean, the, the, the good news, Ephesians 2 says, his purpose was to create a new human race making peace. Ephesians 2 says, he himself is our peace. He says he came to preach peace. Jesus came to bring the culture of heaven in, in, into the earth. How many of you know for sure that you can get really good Mexican food in Dallas? How did that happen? How did we get... How did we get really good Mexican food in Texas? Well, people who understood Mexican culture came to Texas, and instead of settling for beans and sausages that the cowboys were eating, they said, we're going to bring I, I'm, I'm out of my league here on this, but we're going to bring some good food to Texas. So you got to get this. The people who had a culture brought the culture to a new place so that the new place could live in the benefits of the culture they came from. You... Oh, do you know who you are? You're a child of peace. Heaven has come into your heart. You bring the culture of heaven into the places of the earth. This is the assignment and the vision of the church. That's why we cannot live with inadequate school systems or racism or being worried about what clothes I'm going to wear or what food I'm going to eat next week because Jesus claims that I've come to establish and in increasing kingdom of peace on the earth and it's going to be in my neighborhood thy kingdom come thy will be done I'm convinced I mean I'm just convinced that that the deepest understanding of the life that Jesus wants us to live in and offers to us requires finding the secrets of the kingdom and, and if we just Settle for the parables. I mean, at, at, at one point, that's what we need is parables. But if we settle for the parables, I just tell you, it leaves me dissatisfied. Being saved is really important, but it's not the goal. It's the means to the end. The resurrection is a really big deal, but the resurrection is not the climax of the redemptive plan of God. The resurrection is a means to get us into the kingdom that God says, I'm going to restore everything. The resurrection is one of the ways by which we, we are able to believe this is actually going to happen. And, and, and I don't know how to say it any other way. I'm just thirsty. You know, I was saved when I was four years old. I was filled with the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old. I've been to revivals all over the world. I've seen amazing things. But today, I am thirsty. I'm thirsty because when Jesus says to those guys, I've got some secrets and I'm going to off. Listen, I don't feel condemned today because I'm dissatisfied. I listened to a Christian theologian, a very prominent theologian this past week when the hurricanes were coming toward the Carolinas. I heard him. He, he said, well, there's nothing, really, there's nothing we can really do about these storms. We should pray for comfort and we should, and we should be generous to those who are going to suffer because the storm is going to hit and, and thousands of people are going to die. Did you guys see this? This hadn't had anything to do with my sermon, but did you see the weather reporter who was leaning in the wind? And, <laughs> Storming, and the two guys walked by looking at him like, What is, did you see that? That was just, that was, 
I mean, this was the worst storm that was going to ever hit. It was just people, thousands and thousands of people were going to die. And I heard the theologian say, there's nothing we can do. We just need to, we just need to pray for comfort for those who are going to be devastated and, and help those who are going to. And we should pray for comfort for those who are hurt. And we need to be generous to people when they suffer. But Jesus imagined a group of kings who could speak to a mountain and it would be cast into a sea. Jesus, st- Jesus stopped the hurricane one day and he said, I could do what he did did. And, and, and so I'm thirsty for those kinds of kingdom secrets and I may never get them, but to not try to get them is not an option for me, not any longer. Jesus met that Samaritan woman at the well and he said, if you're thirsty, I'll, I'll meet your thirst. And I don't know if there's anybody else that's been all the way through the membership seminar and the plunge party and you're still thirsty but I am. I had a member ask me not too long ago, I wish you'd just give us a radical, scary vision instead of just building programs. We can do that. Give us something that just stretches us out. Okay, how's this? Rule the earth. (laughs) Move the hurricane the next time it comes. Let there be peace on earth. Let the king's dominion start extending through our faith and hands and love and so our series is going to be about finding dominion we were made for success number two it's going to be about healing the land that we live in number three it's going to be about a new way to read the bible it's not information it's a constitution for a new kingdom and Number four, we're going to talk about what it means now, not someday in heaven. Anyway, one day the greatest prophet who ever lived was discouraged, understandably so. John the Baptist was the very first to see that Jesus would bring back the lost kingdom of peace. And John's in jail, and so he sends a messenger to Jesus. Jesus, tell us the truth. (laughs) Are Are you the one we've been waiting on or... So we look for somebody else, and, and Jesus sent the messenger back and, and said, just tell John this, and I'm reading from the Bible now, Matthew 11, the blind see again, the crippled walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised back to life again, and the poor and the broken now hear the hope of salvation. In other words, and Jesus did put it in other words in verse 32, he said, the kingdom realm has arrived. The realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth, and passionate people have taken hold of its power. Becky and I came across this one in our devotions this week out of Acts chapter 14, verse 22. It says, at each place they went, this is what a missions trip needs to look like. (laughs) This is what a missions trip needs to look like. Every place they went, they strengthened the lives of the believers and they encouraged them to go deeper in their faith. And they taught them it is necessary for us to enter into the realm of God's kingdom because that's the only way we will endure our trials and persecutions. I'm just here to remind the 11 o'clock service that there's a whole lot more church than making money and raising your kids and buying your houses and coming to church on the weekend because Jesus really wants to be seen and known in our neighborhood. And I believe that we can find these secrets or receive them. I, I, I think we can drink this. I think we can do this. But I know we need to desire this. And so I have an introductory outline. Can, would you, can I give it to you in 10 minutes? I won't preach all three points, just the first one. I'll talk about the first one. Here's the introductory outline. If you have an app, you'll be, a, you'll be good, right? The rest of you will be lost. But if you got, no, I'm just kidding. Here's the, the, the kingdom Jesus came, the, Je, the kingdom Jesus is offering us is number one, practical, number two, relational, and number three, invitational. So let's just talk about how practical it is. John 1, 4 says, life was in him. And I, and I love this It says, life that made sense of human existence. Life was in Jesus. Life that made sense of the reason you're here. Jesus delivered life. This is so important. He delivered life to men and women where they lived and as they were. In other words, the kingdom of God came to the back roads. The kingdom of God came to unimportant places, and the context of the kingdom was 
friendships and jobs and families and injustices in society. He was a carpenter, for goodness sake. He could have been a computer software engineer or a teacher in the public school system or a waiter or an auto repair mechanic. I'm trying to make a point with you that he could have done what you do and his dominion, his authority from heaven would have been exactly the same. His rule occurred in a life just like the one you're living. He could have stayed in your apartment. I'm trying to make the point, this is the theological statement, human details are not hindrances to the king's dominion, but the actual stage where his rule occurs. Human details are not hindrances to the king's dominion, but the actual stage where his rule occurs. In other words, there's a vision here, gang. There's a vision that the ordinary becomes invaded with heaven's rule and heaven's peace and heaven's love and heaven's resources. The glory of the kingdom, that's a very important word. We'll study it in a way we've never studied it before. The glory of the kingdom showed up in alabaster boxes and boats and fishing nets and weddings, and on the day that taxes were due. I mean, the glory of the Lord just showed up in regular old, and I'm here to declare it will, uh, the glory of the Lord will show up in your classroom. The glory of the Lord will show up at your family reunion. The glory of the Lord will show up in your business venture. The glory of the Lord is available in the ordinary circumstances of life. Matthew. 3.2 3.2 says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the motto. That's the secret. That's the secret of the kingdom, that it's at hand. It means available. Matthew 4.17 says, from that time Jesus began to preach, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 10.7 says, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of God is. And so this is the offer that Jesus makes. He's like, your normal life can be so interactively joined with this dynamic, unseen, divine infusion of heaven, and it can come into the situations of your soul. And this is the main idea of the Bible stories. This is is what the Bible tells us. I mean, Abraham, watch this, watch this. Abraham was not counted righteous because he believed in a sacrifice that removed his sins. He was counted righteous because he believed God was going to give his wife a baby. He was kind of righteous because he thought God would participate in his family planning. Abraham had sex with, I don't know if you know this or not, and I'm embarrassed that this is in the Bible, but Abraham had sex with his wife's maid. Her name was Hagar. He was trying to make heaven stuff happen in earthly ways. And and Hagar got put out. She got pregnant with Abraham's son. So Hagar got put out by jealous Sarah. And do you know the story? A few of you? And, and so here's the scene. Hagar is out in the wilderness as a single mom with a baby that is dying of thirst. And here's what the Bible says about that. But God heard the voice of the lad The angel of God called to Hagar, here's the key, out of heaven and said, don't be afraid, and opened her eyes to a well of water that was nearby. Heaven showed up for a single mom. That's why these stories are in the Bible. Abraham Abraham is ready to sacrifice Isaac. And, And the Bible says the angel of the Lord called to him, here's the key, out of heaven. And said, don't touch that boy. Guys, heaven is not beyond the moon. It's in a bush waiting to be discovered. And and Jacob, that's a whole other story. Jacob is on the run from his brother. What a dysfunctional family that is. He's asleep in the ditch with a stone as his pillow. And while he's in this despicable condition, the Bible says, it's a throwaway line for the Bible. It's just a throwaway line. It says, and, and, and the Lord stood beside him. What? 
A guy that has no character, a guy that has no faith, a guy that, you know, his whole family could have been on Jerry Springer. I mean, it's just such a mess. And the Lord stood beside him. God spoke to Moses, watch this, from heaven in the presence of the people, and he received the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 says, God thundered from heaven against his enemies. I'm just trying to get you to see that whatever circumstance those guys faced, there was an out of heaven episode that changed their story. And the main idea that eventually evolved among the people of the Old Testament was something, something like this. The eyes of the Lord must run back and forth across the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. I'm just trying to get you to see. They expected something out of heaven if their heart could just be right, perfect toward him. If they could learn the secrets of pleasing God. And then we get to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, there's Jesus. He's interacting daily as heaven's representative. And you know what his secret is? He says, I'm just doing what I see my father doing. And I, I'm just saying what I hear my father saying. There's this, and then, and then we got the transfiguration, which shows us there's a very thin membrane between heaven and earth in some places on that particular mountain. You didn't know if you were in the earth or if you were in heaven. Do you remember what Garlington said about our house? He said, this is a thin place. I didn't know what it meant. I know what it means now. It means there's a very very thin membrane between the peace that's in heaven and the peace that can come to earth. I mean, Jesus is showing us the, the transfiguration and then there's the ascension and, and, and then there's the upper room where there came a sound from heaven. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak. I'm just trying to get you to see Jesus as relevant to your life. No, no, he's relevant to your life. And he expects us to expect out of heaven episodes. He expects us to expect that the culture of heaven would operate in the earth. And, and, that, and that he's still looking for people on whose behalf he can thunder out of heaven or show wells in the wilderness or stop you from doing a crazy thing to your kid or, or, or put fire from heaven on your head or in your heart. And it's not so we can get inspired, church. It's not so we can gather on Sundays and clap our hands and say, oh, look, look, look. It's so that we can invoke the king's dominion into first our needs and then our deeds. God really wants heaven displayed in the earth. Is this scaring you? We're going to go here. The second thing about the kingdom is that it's relational. And I'll just say that if if you don't feel doted upon by your father, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna do well in the kingdom. It'll be hard for you. It's all about love. And the third thing is that it's invitational. And again, I'll save that for some other time, but basically the idea is simply that in the Beatitudes, there's a whole category. And I used to think these are requirements to get the blessing. Matthew 5, it keeps saying, blessed are these people, and blessed are these people, and blessed are these people. And I used to think I had to do all these things to get the blessing. But I realized now those are just categories of episodes in your life. So, for instance, Jesus is saying, even if you're poor, you can be blessed. Even if you're mourning, you can be blessed. Even if you're brokenhearted, you can be blessed. Even if you're pure in your heart, you can be blessed. Even if you're persecuted, you can be blessed. You can be blessed. It's an invitation. Whatever circumstance your life is in right now, God has a kingdom for you. Don't mess with me. I came back from Russia. Let's play some music and let me pray. I'll tell you one more, one more story. Two years ago, whenever I came back from Russia, some of you may remember the story about the banya. Do you remember the banya? Do you know what a banya is? It's kind of like a sauna, but it, you remember now? It's kind of like a sauna, but it doesn't, like they build the fire outside the sauna and they put all this heat inside this room and, and, and so when I got back to Russia this year after two years ago, they, they, but what happened two years ago was they, they, and they took me salmon fishing, and after it was cold, and after the salmon fishing, they said, oh, it'll be okay because we built a banya for you, and we're going to let you come in. And, to, to, and, and I'll just, I don't know how to say this without getting too graphic, but Russian men have a lot of testosterone. <laughs> and they just like to just 
let's go kill a bear. I mean, that's, the, that's just their personality, you know. And, and when you, and, I mean, I've taken a sauna before in the U.S., but I wear a towel or a bathing suit like at L.A. Fitness. But these guys, these guys don't, well, they, towels are not allowed. They are not allowed. <laughs> And they're very big men, and, and, the, and the banyas are very small, and it, all the preachers in Russia want to get in the banya with the guest and the, and the general superintendent. So I'm just trying to get you to see that there's no space. You're touching one another, and people are standing, and we had a prayer meeting in the banya that well, I'll never forget all of my life. And so when I got back this year, two years later, same, same leaders, same guys, two years later, they say, I bet you can't wait for the banya. And I'm like, well. Uh. <laughs> well, this year they upgraded the banya. They upgraded it. They're, they're, like, they're like, oh, you're going to love this one because now it's, it's a black banya. It's black. I was like, what is that? I said, well, and, and I didn't know. They spend days making this ready. They spend days, they, they, they build a fire outside, but they use special kind of wood and it makes it smoky, really smoky on the inside. It makes the wood black on the inside and the wood holds the heat for days, literally. And they just, they, they've gone all over the forest to gather this wood. They build a fire in the firebox. They make sure it's smoking and I feel like a piece of pork. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I'm in a smoker. I mean, I'm just, I'm their guest, you know. And so we're talking about the black banya and all of them. They get the bush and they start beating you like that. And I'm just like, wow, this is missionary story in the making. But I'm just like, this is, so we got to talk and I was like, guys, do you know? I mean, they told me all the things they had to do to make a black banya. I said, don't you know they have electricity now? It's like, you don't have to. It's like in the U.S., we have saunas. We actually have Russian spas. There's one in North Dallas. We have, and they use electricity there. And I just kind of made a joke because I was working on this sermon. I just kind of, hey, I have an announcement to make. Electricity is at hand. (laughs) And I know that's a corny illustration, but do you know there's a lot of people living right around us? who are really hungry for spiritual food. And and we are the only ones who can say, hey, guys, the dining room is at hand. And there's a lot of food prepared for you. There's a lot of blind people who need someone that can see to say, hey, sight for you is at hand. Or people in prison who can say, hey, freedom is at hand. It's at hand. It's available. And I don't know. I just, I'm just done with Christianity. I'm just done with the politics of it. And I, I, I don't know if I want to renounce it or not because you'll take it out of context and you'll go tell somebody, our pastor renounced Christianity today. I don't want to do that, but I just want to say there's so much more than what we've been living in. And I don't know if we can get there, but I, I think we ought to try. And that's the ask. Will you, will you with me become kingdom searchers? Kingdom participants. She's like, how do we do that? Well, come to the sermons. Come listen to the sermons. See, it's a trick, right? Get you to come back to church. But, but really, the key word is let's just repent. Let's just evaluate how we've been living and decide that Jesus gave us more opportunities than we've been participating in. Let's evaluate the way we've been living and see if there's a better way to live because I think there is. All right, let's pray. Stand together. This is the introductory sermon. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, please. I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to let you go. The, The key to coming into this kingdom is, I mean, I can't really dismiss without saying this. The key to coming into this kingdom is to make sure you have a spiritual union with God, to make sure that you have this relationship. It's a relational kingdom. You have to have a relationship. And the only way to do that is to open your heart to the Holy Spirit and let Him come in and begin the union. 
If you've never done that, please don't leave today without welcoming the Holy Spirit. He's searching to and fro across the earth to see whose hearts he can he can ignite with his life and his love. And if that's never happened, then you know, let's let's settle that. But maybe some of you today, our closing prayer, you know, you're an information only believer. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I've just been hanging out in the parables. I feel, Pastor, like you. Something's been missing. Something's missing in my life. And I'm ready to do whatever I need to do to welcome the secrets. I, I want the heavenly realm in the earth. So you, you can pray for me, Pastor, that I, would, I wouldn't just be satisfied with information only. And maybe there's somebody here that has a very specific episode where you need heaven's peace to come into the earth. You need you need the culture of heaven to happen here now. You need it to be at hand. Those are the three ways I'd like to pray. Number one, that some would begin your spiritual union now. Number two, that some would say, I'm not going to be an information-only believer anymore. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get these secrets of the heavenly realm operating in my life. Or number three, some would say there's a specific episode where I need heaven to be at hand. And, and I'd like you to pray for, for me. So if you're, particip- if you're willing to participate in this prayer, would you just show me your hand all over the house? It's like, yep, that's me. It fits my heart. One of those fits my heart. Good. That's most of you. I'm going to pray a, a general prayer, but then I am going to open these altars up. If you'd like some personal prayer, I think, I think we'd probably have some people that would be willing to do that. And, uh, just for time. That's the only reason I'm not just asking you to come forward now, but I want to pray for you. Everybody lift your heart with your hands. Would you do that? Just the whole house. Just lift your heart with your hands. So Jesus, I'm praying for every lifted heart. We were raised in a Christian culture. Some people call America a Christian nation. I'm I'm frustrated with it. I know that there's more. I know that there's a life that you purchased for us. And I can't give all the explanations as to why we've stayed in the parable so long, but Lord, I know that you long for a group of people with whom you can trust your secrets. (laughs) And Lord, we want to be that people. We're actually saying today, do whatever you need to do, Lord, so that you don't have to withhold the Father's full plan from us. So, Lord, for those in the room who have never really begun um, the kingdom journey, the the relationship with Father, the the spiritual union, Lord, I I pray for them now. I pray for us now, Lord. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. Come on, just say it out loud, everybody. We receive the Holy Spirit who helps us to enter and to see this kingdom. Come on, one more time. I feel the presence of the Lord here. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we make a vow today that we're not going to be an information-only church. We're going to learn these secrets, and we're going to live in them. And Lord, uh, for those who have come today needing a breakthrough or needing a, a peace on earth, I ask heaven to come into the earth. I pray that what is happening in heaven would happen in their lives. What, Lord, show them what you want to be for them in this moment. And, and help, us to, help us to be kingdom people. Father, you, you know what I mean when I say I'm going to renounce Christianity. I'm doing it with the t- my tongue in my cheek. But God, I just don't. I just don't want to stay in the levels we've been in for so long. I want to become men and women of the kingdom. So hear our prayer. Know our heart. Help us go there. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said...